tell us? The elites have concluded that the global economy is in for a tough haul over the course of the next year. They're finally coming clean and admitting what I've been telling you since, oh, I don't know, July of 2020. They, it, it doesn't work when you have a federal government that's handing out money and you have a Federal Reserve simultaneously handing out money. Oh, and then you factor in the disaster overseas. This is what you call a perfect storm. Or I do believe, as Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan, called it a hurricane, an economic hurricane. Well, they're finally now coming clean. We're going to talk a little bit today about what it means for you, what it means for your savings investment, all those kinds of things. Plus, oh my goodness, Elon. Elon, you are killing me here. 5420 a share. I'm not so sure people are going to see it at this point. I do still think the deal gets done, and I do still think he wants the deal to get done, but he knows, look, if uh, a good percentage of those accounts are not actually real, well, it may not be worth as much money. So that's what's going on. I'm going to bring you up to date. There's a new report actually that just came out that suggests it could be as many as 10% of all Twitter accounts are fake. So what does that do to the share price? What does that do to this deal, given that he signed off doing any due diligence? I am Trish Regan. Welcome to The Trish Regan Show. A quick reminder, portions of today's program are brought to you by Legacy Precious Metals. There's never been a better time to invest in precious metals than right now. So go to LegacyPMInvestments.com today for more. LegacyPMInvestments.com. I do want to talk some more about that a little bit later in the program. But let's start off, right, with what we're hearing out of, as I said, the global elites, you've now got the World Bank coming out and admitting that most countries are going to be facing recession this year. You know, the World Bank is led by a very smart guy, a guy I've known for many, many years, David Malpez. He was actually a Trump appointment there at the World Bank. And it, he's he's always been spot on. I'll just say this again. I've known him a long time in his economic research, and I trust his feel for the overall economy. And so I, I hate to lump him in with the quote unquote elites in, in such a way. But look, I think the reality is this. A lot of big organizations, including things like the World Bank, are a little bit hesitant to come forward and be predictors of, well, kind of bad stuff, right? Because everybody wants to be optimistic and positive, but then all of a sudden reality sets in. I mean, maybe this is one of the reasons why so many people kept saying it's transitory, it's transitory, it's transitory when it came to inflation. I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's not because I actually know how these things work. My reporting from the front lines, right? I, I've been reporting on markets since going all the way back to 2000 as a journalist, but then as an analyst, these are, are, you know, now things that you start to develop a sense for and you can spot, which is one of the reasons why I kept saying all along, you just can't have your cake and eat it too here. You are going to have a hangover with all this money printing. And sure enough, here we are. We're facing it. We got news today that mortgage originations are the lowest they've been in 22 years. I mean, you'd expect them to, to dip a little, right? Because mortgage rates are going up, but they're the lowest they've been in 22 years. You got Target saying, whoa, we have all this inventory that we can't move. They're actually gonna slash prices, which may bode well, I should point out, for inflation. But you got a lot of other things out there now that suggest we've got problems, primarily, I would argue, because of energy prices being as high as they are. You can't have 122 bucks on a barrel of oil and not expect that that's going to have some repercussions on the overall economy and everyday people. There was a study out today, actually a Rasmussen poll, that showed 34% of Americans say, quote, a depression is not likely. <laughs> depression, I mean, that's how bad I think sentiment is. Um, and it's only, it's kind of amazing to me that only 34% are saying a depression is not likely. Look, I'm pretty bearish. You know that. I have a lot of concerns about oil prices, inflation, stagflation, you name it. I'm not that worried about a quote unquote depression, but I'll tell you this, it shows how sentiment matters and, and how sort of the thinking sets in and that can be problematic, right? Because when people feel bad about their future and they start to worry about things like a depression, 
well, then that impacts their spending and their willingness to go out and spend. So perhaps that's not that I'm giving anybody an excuse here, but perhaps that's one of the reasons why people haven't really wanted to come full out and say what it is. But here's the deal. We're probably going to get a recession. The Atlanta Fed just came out, just came out and said, look, we're not going to see as much growth. They had been predicting over 1%. Now it looks more like 0.9%. I'll tell you this. If it's not 0.9%, if it actually dips into negative territory, then that would classify as two quarters of negative growth, meaning the classic definition of recession. The other thing you got to keep in mind is a lot of people don't know that we're actually in recession until after the fact, right? Because all those economic numbers get redone and redone and redone. They call them revisions. And then it turns out, lo and behold, oh, who knew? By the time you find out you're in recession, here's the good news, you're often coming out of it which is why I try to work very much in real time data because I think as an investor, you need to know that, you need to understand what's really, really going on, even when the Federal Reserve clearly does not. Anyway, the World Bank and David Malpez, they're predicting that many, many countries will slip into recession. They're lowering their forecasts for growth. They're predicting a 1970s style stagflation and again, I kind of laugh because I'm like, now you tell us, right? I've been saying this for some time. If you listen to this show, which I hope you do, by the way, if you haven't subscribed, do that right now. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Give the video a thumbs up. If you're listening on Apple iTunes or Spotify, make sure you give it some stars. Anyway, it's good to have you all here. The World Bank saying that global growth is forecasted to be 2.9%. And this would be down from January's 4.1% because subdued growth will likely persist throughout the decade because of weak investment in most of the world. A lot of this is fallout of what we're seeing overseas, but a lot of it's also just tied to these higher energy prices. And look, inflation is an issue. And gosh darn it, the Federal Reserve really screwed up on that one. I, I, I'm not going to belabor it because I've told you that many times before, but you know how badly they screwed up. And Jerome Powell could go down in history if this does not end well as one of the worst Fed chiefs ever because it was obvious and he did absolutely the wrong thing. This was that George Costanza moment when the Fed should have said, you know, we really want to print because we think that's going to help. You do the opposite. Well, right now, the American people are sort of taking the pain, right? Because the Fed has to take their medicine, which means we all pay the price. Higher interest rates, 50 basis points. I mean, we haven't seen this like ever, not in my, well, maybe like when I was a really little kid, right? In the seventies, we haven't seen anything like this. So the Fed has to come out, be super, super, super aggressive, restrict that money supply. And in doing so, hopefully tame inflation. Hopefully, I say hopefully because I'm not convinced they can. But what will happen is a pullback in activity. And thus, that's why you're seeing people not apply for mortgages in the same way that they have done before, right? Makes sense because those mortgage rates are going up. I would still say this, as uh, worried as I am, I, I don't worry about a Great Depression, but I do think we're gonna have a slight recession here, which means the stock market could be in for some more challenging times. I mean, there's some metrics that one looks at, including volatility, for example, or you might look at, say, the 200-day moving average of some of these stocks and where they are relative to that 200-day. And then the last thing, you, you tend to look at the, the spread in bond yields. And um, what we're not seeing enough of, right, is a big enough spread. We're not seeing enough stocks trading below their 200 day average. And you're really not seeing the, the fear in the marketplace that would be symptomatic of a bottom. The VIX, which measures volatility, the VIX index. I, I love watching this because it really gives you a sense of when people are thrown in the towel. And right now it's trading around 25. So not enough really to uh, suggest we're, we're at the bottom. And so it's gonna go one of two ways, right? Either we manage through this and nothing really comes completely undone and isn't that great. And by the way, you know what? Jerome could look like a hero. Who knows when it's all said and done. Or people could say, gee, this recession thing, this is not good. And stagflation is here and we've got a problem. And so you start to see more of a sell-off in stocks. And so that's what I've been watching for. The one thing, right, 
that I think you can be rather assured of is that energy prices are going to continue to go higher, which means inflation is going to continue to go higher. And the reason energy prices are going higher is because, well, we don't have enough of it. Even with green energy being, you know, the, 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 the flavor of the week. And, you know, I, who's to say? Look, I, I think if you put the proper investment, that could happen eventually. It's just not going to happen in time for us to deal with the challenges we're facing right now. But even so, right now, I think it counts for about 17% of our energy. So it's not enough to make up for the supply challenges we're having, both in terms of nat gas and in oil. So I would anticipate that oil prices will go higher. Here we are hanging out at 122. I've called for 130. I've got a lot more to say on this, including an index I think you should consider buying if you're looking to have some some small portion of your portfolio, and I, I caution all the time, you need to be very careful in terms of your distribution um, of assets and in terms of your diversity, but you should check out what I was saying. You can join my Locals channel, which is at trishregan.locals.com, and I put out a lot of private notes there a few times a week that kind of include some of my observations on the markets. I talk so much about politics and policy right here, but all of that has an implication in terms of our overall economy and in terms of perhaps your investment style. So go check that out, trishregan.locals.com. Sign up. You can talk to me directly there. But in the meantime, just know, look, energy prices will continue moving higher. And I don't think there's a way around that, which is why I do think we're going back to this 1970s environment. Inflation will continue to happen alongside low economic growth, which brings me to one of our uh, wonderful partners here that I, I just want to tell you about Legacy Precious Metals because Legacy Precious Metals wants to make sure, as do I, that you've been able to mitigate some of this in your portfolio and in your savings, right? Because think about it, a dollar today, it's a fraction of what it was in 1972. My parents, I love this story, they, they bought and built their house on a couple acres back in New Hampshire for $39,000 in 1972. And, I mean, it's probably approaching seven figures right now. Now, think about that. I mean, 39000 $39, back then, that was a lot of money, but still within the realm of normalcy, right? When you start talking about seven figures, that's not in the norm of realmacy anymore. And so the danger is you start to get out, outbid effectively. You know, you're, you're, you're outpriced because all this inflation catches up with you. And if you're diligently saving and you haven't figured out how you're gonna adjust for all that inflation, then you're kind of gonna be left in the dust. The one thing that I think you just always need to remember, because we don't think about that enough with portfolios, you don't think, well, how is this gonna work with inflation? You've got to make sure that you stay ahead of inflation, and that's not easy right now, given that it's 8.3%, right? So check out Legacy Precious Metals. You can call them. You're welcome, welcome to use my name. They're friends of mine, and I know they'll take good care of you. Let me give you that number. It's one 866 589-0560. Again, that's 1-866-589-0560. Just make sure you're protected. You can get a gold-backed IRA. You can get the actual physical stuff. Whatever it takes, just make sure that your savings can withstand this onslaught of inflation that I, I think is going to continue, really. I mean, look, it, it's what they're telling us. That's what's in the tea leaves right now. Anyway, I want to turn to Elon Musk because this guy is killing me. I, I am a big Elon Musk fan. I think He's a brilliant guy. I think having him involved in, in this space is actually really important and, and a lot of good could come of it, but I don't know if he's gonna get there. Actually, I do think he's gonna get there. I do think he wants the company. I think he just doesn't want it for $54.20 a share. And it's a little bit tricky because there's that whole, look, I'm buying it. I'm just buying it. And uh, it doesn't matter what what anything is. It's I, I've described this to you all before. It's like, you know, you. You go and you see this great house that you want to buy off the street and you don't know what the bones are like. You don't know how the electricity is or how the basement is. And, and then you buy it or you, you sign a paper to buy it. And you say, I, I, you know what, I'm going to waive all my rights to all that stuff. There's no inspection. 
And I'm going to buy for cash. And then it turns out like the bank basement's flooded and you, you figure out the basement's flooded. And you're like, wait a second, this, this house is not worth what I offered to pay. So there's a little bit of that going on. He's got a little bit of buyer's remorse. I mean, especially look where Tex Ben since he made the initial bid. And so now it's going to be kind of a contest of wills. And a part of me thinks that <laughs> you don't want to fight Elon Musk on that one. I think that he might actually, you know, th this is very unusual. This is, I, I will just say this because it is not often in merger deals that you would get a haircut on the price. I mean, it just doesn't happen. There's only like one time it's ever happened and that was with Tiffany. But hey, you know what? It, he might get it done only because this thing is so darn messy. I mean, think about it. If you're on the board of Twitter right now, you're like, whoa. First of all, you couldn't say no to the deal because it was an amazing offer. I'm like, well, what are they thinking? But now that they've said yes, and now that there's all this commotion, I mean, what happens? I mean, if they say, okay, we'll take a haircut on the deal, guess what? Twitter shareholders will sue the board. Of course they're gonna sue. There's gonna be tons of litigation because they'll say, why did you do that? You had an agreement. Now, if Elon somehow backs out of this thing, and look, if he does, he's gonna have to pay a $1 billion breakup fee, then again, the, the shareholders will sue the board. So it, there could be a heck of a lot of litigation. I don't think that the board wants that. I don't think the company wants that. I think that they would like to just have this done, you know, and have everybody go on their merry way. But I don't think Elon's willing to do it now at this price. 5420, in his estimation, especially in light of this new report, came out today, by the way, an organization, I believe, out of the UK, estimating that 10% of the accounts on Twitter are actually fake. Well, if that turns out to be true, is that enough of a material change in the business, right? To actually change it all up and get a haircut on the deal or maybe just not have the deal happen at all. Right now, he's allegedly stopped all talks with any investors. He was gonna have investors help uh, cover some of the costs here. So we'll see. But uh, I'd be sweating this one, I think, big time. I mean, you look at where shares are trading. It looks like people think this will get done somewhere. Perhaps not, however, at the 5420. And I'll tell you this, it will make history. If he succeeds in getting a lower price, it will be historic. And then we'll get to see what happens next, right? <laughs> hey, listen, thank you for being here. Thank you to all of you for appreciating the very casual atmosphere. I have this studio back up and working, but you all love this so much. I'm like, oh, what the heck? You know, it's kind of nice to, to be hanging out in my library as opposed to uh, up in the studio. But I love having you here. Do me this favor. Subscribe to the podcast. Go to my Locals channel, trishregan.locals.com, and I'll see you again tomorrow.